Hey, boys and girls. I am sitting out here on my front porch. My dog, Molly, is sitting over laying in the sun. It's so beautiful out here. It's still just a little chilly, but um, so I had to put my sweater on from when I talked to you earlier. Um, <clears throat> so we started yesterday reading the book called The K, and I gave you some background information about it yesterday. So if you want to know all that information, you'll need to watch um, yesterday's video. But we do know that um, Philip and his family live on an island called Curacao. And Curacao is an island um, that is just north of South America, which I talked to you guys yesterday about. And um, uh, it is during World War II. And Curacao, at their, on their island, there is a refinery there, uh, just like we have uh, in Lima, that they make um, aviation fuel, which is airplane, airplane fuel. And um, so they are at risk of being bombed because the Germans uh, don't want the Americans to have airplane fuel. So there's a lot of, a little bit of scary stuff. Uh, we met uh, Philip yesterday and found out that he's not really scared of war. He thinks it's kind of just fun and he wants to go out and see the German submarines and and he thinks it's pretty cool. Uh, Mom and Dad, however, are, are letting him know that it's, it's very dangerous um, for him to even be outside. Um, so let's go ahead and start with uh, chapter two. We finished dinner just as it was getting dark, and my father went outside to look at our house. He wanted to see if the blackout curtains were working. While my mother and I stood by each window, he called out if he, was the if he saw the slightest crack of light. By the governor's orders, not a light could shine anywhere on the whole island, he said. Then he went back to the refinery. I crawled onto the couch downstairs about nine o'clock, but I couldn't sleep. I kept thinking about the U-boats off of our coast and those lake tankers with barefooted Chinese sailors on board. I guess I was waiting for the U-boats to send a shell toward Wilmastad. Then I began to wonder if the Germans would send soldiers too. About 9.30, I sneaked out of bed, went to the tool house, and took a hatchet out. I put it under the couch. It was the only thing I could think of to use for fighting the Germans. It must have been 11 o'clock when my father returned from the refinery to get all the flashlights we had in the house. They talked in low voices, but I could hear them. Mother said, it's too dangerous to stay here now. And my father answered, Grace, you know I can't leave. Well, then Philip and I must go back. We'll go back to Norfolk and wait till the danger is over. I sat up in my bed, unable to believe what I was hearing. My, va my father said, there's more danger in the trip back, unless you go by air, than there is in staying here. If they do shell us, they won't hit Charlou. Mother said sharply, you know I won't fly. I'd be frightened to death to fly. We'll talk about it later. My father sounded miserable. Soon afterward, he returned to the refinery again. I thought about leaving the island, and it saddened me. I love the old fort and the schooners and the Reutercade market with the noisy chickens and squealing pigs, the black people shouting. I love the Konoko with its giant cactus, the DBDB trees, their odd branches all on the leeward side of the trunk, the beautiful sandy beach at West Punt. And I'd miss Henrik von Bowman, von Boven. I also knew that Henrik and his mother would think us cowardly if we'd left just because a few German submarines were off Curacao. I was awake most of the night. The next morning, my father said that the Chinese crews on the lake tankers that shuttled crude oil across the sandbars at Maracaibo refused to sail without naval escorts. So they wanted the Navy to escort them so that they would be more safe. He said the refinery would have to close down within a day, and that, meant, and that meant precious gas and oil could not go to England or to General Montgomery in the African desert. So they, they needed the fuel. For seven days, not a ship moved by the Queen Emma Bridge, and there was gloom over Wilmastad. The people had been very proud that the little islands of Aruba and Curacao were now among the most important islands in the world. That victory, or defeat depend, that victory or defeat depended on them. They were angry with the Chinese crews, and on the third day, my father said that mutiny charges had been placed against them. 
But, he said, you must understand, they're very frightened. And some of the people who are angry with them would not sail the little ships either. He explained to me what it must feel like to ride the cargoes of crude oil, knowing that a torpedo or a shell could turn the whole ship into flames any moment. So these Chinese ships that are coming in, they're full of oil and they're taken to the refinery so they can make it into aviation gas. So I don't know about you, but if I was riding on one of those ships, I would not want to be going into that harbor where there was a possibility of a, our ship being bombed and then it would just explode and just everybody be dead. Um, even though dad was not a sailor, he volunteered to help, them, help man the lake tankers. Soon, of course, we might also fun out, run out of fresh water. It rains very little in the Dutch West Indies, unless it's a hurricane, and water from the few wells was a, had a heavy salt content. The big tankers from the United States or England always carried fresh water to us in ballast, and then it was distilled again so we could drink it. But now all the big tankers were being held up in their ports until the submarines could be chased away. Toward the end of the week, we began to run out of fresh vegetables because the schooner men were also afraid. Now my mother talked constantly about the submarines, the lack of water, and the shortage of food. It almost seemed that she was using the war as an excuse to leave Kirikeo. The ships will be moving again soon, my father said confidently, and he was right. I think it was February 21st that some of the Chinese sailors agreed to sail to Lake Maracaibo. But on the same day, a Norwegian tanker headed for Wilmestad was torpedoed off of Kirikeo, and fear again swept over the whole city. Without our ships, we were helpless. Then, a day or two later, my father took me into the Shadagat, where they were completing the loading of the SS Empire Turn, a big British tanker. She had machine guns fore and aft, one of the few armed ships in the harbor. Although the, trading wind, the trade wind was blowing, the smell of gas and oil lay heavy over the Shadagat. Other empty tankers were there, high out of the water, awaiting orders to sail once they had cargoes. The men on them were leaning over the rail, watching all the activity on the Empire turn. I looked on as the thick hoses that were attached to her quivered when the gasoline was pumped into her tanks. The fumes shimmered in the air, and one by one they topped her tanks, loading them right to the brim and re securing them for sea. No one said very much. With all of that aviation gasoline around, it was dangerous. Then in the afternoon, we went to Punda and stood near the pontoon bridge as she steamed slowly down to St. Anna Bay. Many others had come to watch, too, even the governor, and we all cheered as she passed, setting out on her lonely voyage to England. There, she would help refuel the Royal Air Force. So England at this time were allies of America, so they were, they were on their side. So they were trying to fight against the Nazis. So England was working together with America. The sailors on the Empire Turn, which was painted a doll white and had rust streaks, rust streaks all over her, waved back at us. They held up their fingers in a V for victory sign. We watched until the pilot boat, having picked up the harbor pilot from the Empire Turn, began to race back to Wilmestad. Just as we were ready to go, there was an explosion, and we looked toward the sea. The Empire Turn had vanished in a wall of red flames, and black smoke was beginning to boil into the sky. Someone screamed, there it is! We looked off to the one side of the flames about a mile away and saw a black shape in the water, very low. It was a German submarine, surfaced now to watch the ship die. A tug and several small motorboats headed out toward the turn, but it was useless. Some of the women cried at the sight of her, and I saw men, my father included, with tears in their eyes. It didn't seem possible that only a few hours before I had been standing on her deck. I was no longer excited about the war. I had begun to understand that it meant death and destruction. That same night, my mother told my father, I'm taking Philip back to Norfolk. I knew she'd made up her mind. 
He was tired and disheartened over what had happened to the Empire Turn. He didn't say much, but I do remember him saying, Grace, I think you're making a mistake. You're both quite safe here in Charlu. I wondered why he didn't simply order her to stay, but he wasn't that kind of a man. The sunny days and dark, still nights passed slowly during March. The ships had begun to sail again, defying the submarines. Some were lost. Henrik and I often went down to Punda to watch them go out, hoping that they would be safe. Neither my father nor my mother talked very much about us leaving. I thought that when two American destroyers arrived, along with the Dutch cruiser Van Kingsbergen, to protect the lake tankers, mother would change her mind. But it only made her more nervous. Then one day in early April, she said, Your father has finally secured passage for us, so today will be your last day in school here, Philip. We'll start packing tomorrow, and on Friday we'll leave for a ship for Miami. Then we'll take the train to Norfolk in Virginia. Suddenly I felt hollow inside. Then I became angry, and I accused her of being a coward. She told me to go off to school. I said I hated her. All that day in school, I tried to think, of what I could do. I thought about going somewhere and hiding until the ship had sailed. But on an island the size of Kirikeo, there's no place to hide. Also, I knew it would cause my father trouble. That night when he got home, I told him I wanted to stay with him. He smiled and he put his long, thin arm around my shoulder. He said, no, Philip, I think it's best that you go with your mother. At a time like this, I can't be at home very much. His voice seemed sad, although he was trying to be cheerful. He told me how wonderful it would be to return to the United States, how many things I had missed while we were on the island. I couldn't think of one. Then I walked to my mother about staying on in Wilmestad, and she became very upset with both of us. She said we didn't love her and began to cry. My father finally ended it by saying, Philip, the decision is made. You'll leave Friday with your mother. So I packed, with her help, and said goodbye to Henrik von Boven and the other boys. I told them we'd be gone only a short time, that we were going to visit my grandparents, my mother's parents, in Norfolk, Virginia. But I had the feeling that it might be a very long time before I saw Kirikeo and my father again. Early Friday morning, we boarded the S.S. Hato in St. Anna Channel. She was a small Dutch freighter with a, bow, with a high bow and stern, and a bridge house in the middle between two well decks. I had seen her often in St. Anna Bay. Usually she ran between Wilmestad, Aruba, and Panama. She had a long stack uh, and always puffed thick black smoke. In our cabin, which was on the starboard side and open out to the boat deck, my father said, well, you can rest easy, Philip. The Germans would never waste a torpedo on this old tub. Yet I saw him still looking over the lifeboat. Then he inspected the fire hoses on the boat deck. I knew he was worried. There were eight other passengers aboard, and they were all saying goodbye to their relatives, just as we were saying goodbye to my father. In the tradition, people brought flowers and wine. It was almost like sailing in the days before the war, they told me. Father was smiling and very happy, but when the Hato's whistle blasted out three times, meaning it was time to go, he said goodbye to us between clenched teeth. I clung to him for a long time, and finally he said, Take good care of your mother. I said I would. We sailed down St. Anna Bay, and the Queen Emma Bridge parted for us. Through watery eyes, I saw the fort in the old buildings of Punda and Otrabanda. Native schooners were beating in from the sea. Then my mother pointed. I saw a tall man standing on the wall of Fort Amsterdam waving at us. I knew it was my father. I'll never forget that tall, lonely figure standing on the sea wall. The SS Hato took her first bite of open sea and began to pitch gently. We turned toward Panama as we had to make a call there before proceeding to Miami. Down on the well decks, fore and aft, were four massive pumps that had to be delivered to Colon, the port at the Atlantic entrance to the Panama Canal. I stayed out on deck for a long time, sitting by the lifeboat, looking back at Kirikeo, feeling lonely and sad. Finally, my mother said, come inside now. Then I'm going to read to you the very first sentence of chapter three. 
We were torpedoed at about 3 o'clock in the morning on April 6, 1942, two days after leaving Panama. I'm going to stop there. It's a great story. All right. So I hope you guys have a fantastic weekend. Um, just enjoy your free time and be ready to get started on your Google Classroom things. I will be monitoring the work that you do. And um, I can't wait to see you guys next week. And um, I love you guys. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.